This next panel I'm really excited about as well. I've had a fascination with the Ozark Jubilee for many years. My mother, Jeanette Alcorn, worked for Jerry Redford for many years, and Jerry was one of the original promenaders from the Ozark Jubilee, which if you remember, L.D. Keller and the promenaders were the square dance group of the Jubilee. So as a young man, I've heard stories all my life about the Ozark Jubilee, and so uh, years later, began that fascination of speaking to those who participated firsthand, and thus met a kindred spirit of Tom Peters from the library at Missouri State University, yes, who is writing about the Jubilee and was able to, you know, not everybody wants to talk about the Ozark Jubilee, so when you find somebody that has a similar interest, you want to talk their leg off. And so I'm so excited about this panel today. Tom has some great panel members, and I know he's going to do a great job. Let's put our hands together for Tom Peters. Thanks everybody, pleasure to be here. This is my first trip to the Cherry Blossom Festival, so I'm impressed uh, and, and glad to be here. And thanks Nicholas for that. So I'm the Dean of Library Services at Missouri State University, formerly known as SMS. I still hear SMS said quite a bit about uh, this, the university down in Springfield. And uh, I, full disclosure, I'm a foreigner. I grew up in Iowa. Uh, I've been down in, uh, in the Ozarks here for nine years now. And I absolutely love it. Learned a long time ago not to predict the future, but I could easily see myself spending the rest of my life in the beautiful Ozarks. I love it down there. So uh, we've got a great panelist. And uh, the Ozark Jubilee, uh, if you're unfamiliar, I hope you know at least the name, it was a nationally broadcast live television program over ABC TV from early 1955 as a national broadcast and all the way up to September of 1960. It was live television. They did it every week for almost six years. Red Foley was the star, uh, but they brought in a lot of country and western uh, and other types of musical talent, comedy talent, uh, square dancers were a big part of the show. I don't think there was a 30-minute segment of the Jubilee that did not have some square dancing in it because it was perfect for television. Um, and so uh, I'm very interested in this. And we have two ex... We probably have, I would say, the two people in the world that are... That are crazier than you. That's right. <laughs> that are the most, you know, certainly in the top five most knowledgeable people living today about the Ozark Jubilee. So to my immediate left, your right, is Wayne Glenn, the old record collector. I hope most of you know Wayne. Yeah. Uh, he is an Ozarker, and so, uh, but he's, he, uh, you know, Wayne does a lot of great stuff, but uh, in the context of the Ozark Jubilee, he was the organizer, and uh, I think he put up with some of his own money for that 1988 marker down in Jubilee Park, uh, where the Jewel Theater used to, to be located. And so, uh, happy to have him here. And then to uh, my far left, your right, is John Bisney from Florida. But he, in the context of this panel discussion, he is the son of Brian Bisney, who was the producer director of the Jubilee for its entire network run. Uh, so we, uh, we were hoping to have one of the promenaders, as, as uh, Nicholas mentioned, on the panel, but unfortunately just didn't work out. So, uh, we're very excited to, to share some of our thoughts and, and uh, uh, information, knowledge about the Jubilee. Um, Wayne, why don't you maybe kick it off by, um, I've heard you say that we have an amazing musical tradition here in the Ozarks. I'll, you know, I grew up in Northwest Iowa. It does not have, I like Northwest Iowa, it does not have an amazing musical heritage. Uh, Lawrence Welk is about the best that we did. You know? so, um, uh, but down here, it has an amazing musical heritage to this day. Um, uh, but I've heard you say that, in your opinion, within that amazing musical heritage, the Ozark Jubilee was the most important musical entertainment event to date 
that came out of the Wizards. Well, that's definitely true. In 1932, Ralph Foster came from St. Joseph, Missouri. He'd already been down here fishing and enjoying the Shepherd of the Hills country, no doubt. And why exactly Ralph Foster decided to come to bring his business interest to Springfield would be hard to say. It's a shame we didn't get a chance to really interview Ralph Foster. He was the man that was the figurehead of KWTO and KGBX radio, starting in 1932-1933. And he got a partner. He was able to get a man as a partner for him and his interest in putting radio stations in Springfield. And that man's name was Lester Cox. We're talking Lester Cox Sr. And Lester Cox, by the time we get to the early 1930s, the height of the Great Depression, he in fact was uh, a wealthy man. Now, he was not rolling in wealth, but he was for his day a wealthy man. And so the fact that Lester Cox was willing to invest in Ralph Foster's dream of bringing those radio stations to Springfield was in fact a turning point for all of this. Now, I don't know, instead we haven't interviewed Ralph Foster about this, I guess that Ralph Foster thought that there was a lot of talent, like he's saying. I'm not so sure that Foster, having probably only been down here eight or ten times from St. Joe, which is a different world, different kind of music up there, I don't know what he thought. But when he came here, there were no networks. There were networks other places, but KWTO and KTBX were not on the new CBS or NBC. So he had to come up with something to play or put on the air for about every 15 minutes. Even in the early years when they didn't weren't on 24 hours a day, he had to come up with something. Well, he soon found what Tom is saying. The fiddlers, the guitarists, the singers, the gospel music, all of these people just came out of the hills. They used to advertise in the newspaper that we would be interested in having people come to our radio station and try out to be on the air, not with any money, but with fame. Because you see, as soon as those radio stations came to Springfield, then they immediately captured whatever radio people had in their homes. So that we go from having basically no, nobody listening to radio, you might say, in Springfield much, to thousands and thousands and thousands of people because those radio stations covered not only Springfield, but they also covered Berryville and Harrison, Arkansas, and West Plains, north, south, east, and west. Not so much to the west, but basically even as far west as Mount Vernon and so on. So when they got these radio stations and have to come up with programming, then they get people like Uncle Joe knocking on the door. Well, it turns out Uncle Joe is Slim Wilson. And knocking on the door is Bill Rain. And knocking on the door is the Hayden family. And it just goes on and on and on. 1932, 1933, 1934. And Ralph Foster found that not only was this talent there, natural talent, it was mostly rural talent. And they found out they could sell it, that people would buy advertising to be on the stations. And that's where that all began, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, John, do you want to make, so you're also a foreigner, uh, well, you're not, you, you were born in Springfield, yeah. but your, your parents uh, are really, of Cana they're Canadians uh, right. by birth and, and uh, upbringing, so tell us a little bit about how your, how your family came down to Springfield. Sure, well, uh, yes, uh, my folks were both from Canada, and I'm the first American in our family, and uh, Dad was involved in radio in Canada before there was television. He worked both in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and then in Toronto, he worked with Jack Kent Cooke. Many of you may not know that name. He owned uh, a hockey team and, and a teleprompter, and he was a big deal. And Dad worked as a time salesman for Jack in Toronto. Um, but then after the war, they came to the States, like many people from other countries, in search of you know, a better opportunity and a better life. So they moved around a little bit. Uh, Dad worked at stations in, uh, I think in um, Illinois, and uh, then he got hooked up with um, the Brown Radio, 
folks and toured around with Eddie Arnold and was sort of an uh, engineer for Eddie Arnold. Dad was rarely on the air. He told me later he did do some hockey play-by-play -play in Canada <laughs> once. But anyway, uh, he was really into the technical end of things. So he toured with Eddie uh, and did the Checkerboard Square program out of St. Louis. And then I think somehow, and you may know more than I do, Wayne, uh, the Brown radio connection to, to what was going on with Ralph Foster. And I think they said to him, would you like to come to Springfield and work on this new program we're going to put on the air? So that's how our family moved to Springfield, which would have been 1953. And I was born a year later, just before the Jubilee came on the air in 1954. So I sort of think. The Jubilee and I sort of almost have similar birthdays. Can I ask you a question? Yes. We've never met before today. He lives in Florida, I live in Nixon, I don't ever go to Florida. <laughs> we've, we've corresponded a little bit. Uh, you say that you all came and your family came in 53. What did your dad specifically do when he first came here? I don't know, Wayne. That's the honest answer. Because I mean, the Jubilee really hadn't started. Really? No, well, he did TV a lot. had come. No, but I mean, he was definitely worked with, with the folks at KWTO at the, on the building on Glenstone. So I think he was involved in the radio end of things. And then when Ralph wanted to put the TV show on the air, somehow he was there. He, he was there. So that's uh -huh. all I can tell you. But he, but, but he came because he had a job. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. They'd hired him. And that's right. That's come right. down here. And so yeah. um, so uh, Charlie Brown uh, plays a role in all. And in the research I've been able to do, sort of what led up to the Jubilee, because the Jubilee wasn't like, oh, let's put on a show, you know, we've never done this before. They actually worked for 20 years trying to, uh, trying different formats and, and ways of presenting. Uh, initially, they were called Hillbilly Variety Shows, and it was Hillbilly Music uh, was what they initially called it. And then now we call it Country Western. Some people call it folk music. Yeah, folk music. That kind of went off into more kind of yeah. a highbrow, intellectual, <laughs> right. kind of, New York City, wear a beret yeah. and smoke bizarre cigarettes, and, you know. Uh, but the folk music was another part, kind of a splinter off of this. But um, uh, one thing that happened, I think, that helped lead to all this and all these people, this amazing group of people coming together to put on the Jubilee for almost six years, uh, more than six years if you count the, the local part of it, um, uh, was what were called transcription services. So Wayne's absolutely correct. For the longest time, if you had a 15-minute show that began at 7 a.m., you were in the studio at 7 a.m. All that programming was live. So when the Carter family, uh, Carter sisters and Mother Maybell with Chet Atkins were here in late 40, 49, 50, and they had a, I can't remember what their show was. It was a pretty early morning show. Those three girls and their mom and Chet Atkins were in the studio playing and singing. There was no, very little pre-recorded uh, things, but they saw a need for that, and what they would make was called transcriptions, which were big discs, and they would record a 15-minute show, an open transcription had time in there to put in a, tip in a local commercial. Oh, great, thank you so much, Mother Maybell. Now let me tell you about Anison, or whatever, you know, or the local feed store, or whatever. Um, and they would sell those to other radio stations. And so both Ralph Foster, through Radio Zark, uh, transcription service, and Charlie Brown had a transcription service over in Nashville, I think it was, initially. Mm -hmm. And I don't know the whole, whole industry, but I'm thinking they were major, pretty major players in the whole transcription business. So they had Smiley Burnett and Tennessee Ernie Ford, and they had a lot of uh, musical talent lined up to make transcription services. I think that might have been part of the mysterious links that led to mm -hmm. all these mm -hmm. things coming together. Eddie Arnold was, in, you know, Charlie Brown kind of developed Eddie Arnold as a as a entertainer, is my understanding. So, you know, it was a small world, but uh, as television started to take off after the war, um, the transcription service started to the whole industry kind of started to shrink. Advertisers were transitioning to television. And so one time, Ralph kind of said, we had to do something because the business was drying up. So we decided to get, we saw an opportunity in television, and so we got into it. Does that align with your thinking about what's going on here? Uh, 
Um, yeah, Wayne knows more about the transcription end of it than I would. Yeah. Anything further you want to say about that? Well, he's, he's mentioning uh, Charlie Brown. Anybody here old enough to have voted for Charlie Brown? <laughs> I'm not talking about peanuts. <laughs> <laughs> There's at least uh, maybe a very few of you that voted for him. You see, uh, when he says Charlie Brown, he's talking about the same man who was really, really intelligent and went to Central High School, senior high school in Springfield. His parents, family were in Springfield. And he graduates about 1939, Charlie Brown. And he was, I think, you know, maybe valedictorian of his class, which would be a great thing at senior high with, you know, four or 500 people in the senior class. And uh, the war goes on and everything. He was a smart man. And he had a brother who was a doctor, who became a doctor, Jim Brown, who was a famous doctor in Springfield later also. And so Jim and Charlie, they decided that transcriptions were the coming thing at, right at the end of World War II. So they formed, as he said, the Brown Transcription Company. And they were able to get an agreement with a guy who was up and coming named Eddie Arnold who was already having hit records, but just getting started, really, it was the earliest part of, his, of Eddie Arnold's successful career. And if you don't know who Eddie Arnold is, he's the most popular, <laughs> he's the number one, still to this day, he sold more records and had more hits than anybody up to Garth Brooks in country music. But he wasn't there in 1946. So the Browns, they were able to get him on the transcription service, and that was a very big success. And they were in New York at one time. Fred Raines worked out of New York. Mm -hmm. And then they went to Nashville, as we're saying. And I think they had St. Louis connections too, as he said. And then Mr. Brown hopped off the ship. In the, Mr. Charlie Brown chopped off the ship in like 1953 or so. Got out of that business at the peak. He got out when it was best and ran against Dewey Short for the Congress of Southwest Missouri. Dewey Short had been in office, two terms, elected over and over again since 1928. But when we get to 1956, Charlie Brown beats Dewey Short and gets out of showbiz. Mm -hmm. and I, that may not have a lot to do with what we're talking about, but <laughs> yes, it does, because that's the basis. This transcription service was a big success initially for Radio Ozarks, and it gave Cy Simon, John Mahaffey, Lester Cox as a silent partner, Ralph Foster, connections to the Eddie Arnolds of the world, to the Browns, and other people. But the Browns did have a role to play. And so Tennessee Ernie Ford becomes a friend of the Ozarks. He bought a big piece of property on the recommendation of Ralph Foster at a place called what is now Branson Airport. Murder Rocks. That was Tennessee Ernie Ford coming to the Ozarks to at least buy property on the recommendation of people that he knew here. Smiley Burnett was well known back in the 30s, 40s, 50s. He did a transcribed show. And Chet Atkins, as you said, who became the pioneer of Nashville sound, the yeah. Nashville sound. Yeah. Chet Atkins worked here. He always had a good relationship with Cy Simon. I was talking to someone last week that lived next door to Cy Simon. Cy's one of the guys that made the Jubilee what it was. He was one of the pioneers of it. And he just, he got bought a few records from him. This guy that I'm talking to last week, by the last name of Long, not Billy, okay? <laughs> and he said, we live next to Cy, and he just casually, I'm looking through records, and he just casually says, you know, Cy, with him it was feast or famine. He said, there were years where they lived and had lots and lots of money. And then the next year, they didn't have a dime. It was feast, it was famine. And that was kind of the story of the Ozark Jubilee. Yeah. Um, the other thing that, uh, you know, the Jubilee ran weekly with no no summer hiatus. It went, I don't think they, I, I, actually, maybe this, I should form it in, in the phrasing of a question. Uh, the first Ozark Jubilee show was over this brand new television station, KYTV out of their studios on West Sunshine. It was the day after Christmas, it was December 26th of 1953. 
they did the first broadcast as a local television broadcast of the Ozark Jubilee. Um, and then in 1954, they continued to do it as a weekly KYTV uh, broadcast, and people were coming to the studio to watch the show live in person, and they were running out of room. There was, the demand was so high, so they had to do something. Uh, in early July of 54, they announced they were going to move it to make it a stage show at the Jewel Theater. Uh, they continued doing it as a K, uh, KWTO broadcast, local broadcast. Uh, I actually think KYTV still had a local broadcast. I think they did some local broadcasting out of, out of the Jewel, but I'm not absolutely certain about that. Then the ABC radio network picked it up as a 25-minute as a national broadcast. And then they convinced ABC TV to try it as a, uh, a, a television national broadcast, and that was what started in 1954, I mean 55, early 55. Um, so I don't think they missed a single week from basically December of 1953 till September of 1960. Every week they did a show. Sometimes it was Thursday night, sometimes, mostly it was a Saturday night, if Saturday fell on New Year's Eve, they did a show. If it fell on Christmas Eve, they did a show. You know, uh, they, I don't think they missed a single week in that entire span. Yeah, I, I think that's right. Um, and let me, I want to take a couple of minutes just to talk to you folks about the significance and the importance of this program. Because we're up here talking about, oh, something that happened in Springfield and local people were involved and that was nice. This was the first national television program to not come out of New York or Los Angeles, okay? That's how big this was. Imagine that. Little Springfield, Missouri is doing a, a weekly national broadcast across, across the country, coast to coast. Was a, in fact, they said that on the uh, marquee of the jewel, right? Coast to coast. Mm -hmm. uh, this was the program. Patsy Cline appeared on the Jubilee more than any other television program. She made six appearances on the Jubilee. No, no other television show can say that. Uh, Tex Ritter made his television debut on the Jubilee. Carl Perkins performed Blue Suede Shoes for the first time on television on the Jubilee. And of course, Red Foley was, was well known for bringing along Brenda Lee, who you may have heard of. <laughs> other people who, who got, got their start, uh, uh, Sonny James, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, Wanda Jackson, uh, Marvin Rainwater. So folks, I mean, the one thing I want to leave you with is how important the Jubilee was at the time in terms of all these firsts that were going on here in the little city of Springfield, and then the legacy of it, because what it did by being a national program, there were, as Tom and, and uh, uh, um, Wayne. Wayne know, there were a lot of little regional things. The Louisiana Hayride here, and you know, there were, and the Grand Ole Opry was was doing a, a filmed show that was on a little bit. But the Jubilee was the first program to bring country, and this is obviously really country music, to across the country. And it was a family show. So often the mom and the dad and the kids would sit down and enjoy this. And I credit, I'm not me, but a lot of people credit the Jubilee with spreading country music and getting America more familiar, in, in the, especially the big cities, to get them exposed to country music. So anyway, I'll shut yeah. up now, but I mean that's... No, I think you're right, and um, to kind of riff on that, so uh, in the research I've done, and I'm not, I'm not an expert by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, 1922 was the year where everybody had to have a radio. It was a real breakout year, was 1922. And a lot of stations. That's 100 years ago. Well, 99. <laughs> That's right. right? Uh, and then uh, a lot of stations cropped up. You know, universities were starting them. Uh, newspapers were starting radio stations. Uh, the, the tire store up in St. Joseph, you know, started a radio station in the corner. That's was Ralph Foster and Jerry Hall's radio station was in a tire store. They were selling tires, um, not radio time. But that's they just got interested in radio because radio was like. In my lifetime, there was a time where computers were like the thing that people got into, you know, building them from parts and all that kind of stuff. Radio was kind of the same thing. If you were, if you had that kind of aptitude, radio was this amazing draw, 
and a lot of people got involved in, in radio that way. I would actually suggest, based on what I think I know, is that when you talk about technological innovations in this broadcast media, radio was much more important and impactful than television was. Because basically with radio, you went from isolation to the world in your living room. Uh, and so it was very, I would say, transformative to not only the Ozarks, but a lot of areas of America. Suddenly, you know, living out in the hills and hollers was a different kind of experience with radio than it was prior to radio, I, I would suggest. That was so. How would, you, uh, how would you like to be an absolute nobody who happened to have talent to sing or play an instrument? And have grown up, as he's saying, in Hollister, start naming, you know, just anywhere around, Marshfield, Grove Spring, Hartville, and have the chance somehow to get to Springfield, which we're talking 1932, 30, he said 22, as far as when radio really started hitting. So 10 years later, he comes to Springfield big time. There had been a station or two in Springfield in the 20s that didn't ultimately make it. But anyway, 1932, 1933. The worst of the Depression was right there, 1932-33 were the two worst years of the Depression, and KGBX came in 32 and KWTO came in 33. And so, they put out, as we said a while ago, they put out the word that they're wanting talent. And to imagine, many people had not ever been beyond Christian County or Webster County or wherever they lived. That might have been the first time in their life they even went to Springfield if it was 20, 30, or 40 miles away, and get to be on the radio and heard live, and then go back home and have all that response from who knows how many people saying, well, I heard you on the radio. Well, that's gotta feed your ego. It may not fill your pocketbook, <laughs> but it fills your ego. Well, how many musicians ever cared about their pocketbooks? The first and most important thing for a musician is to be told, you are good. You did, that was really great. And so if that could happen, and I mean, I knew Slim Wells, and I didn't know him well. I know a number of you also knew him. He was from the Knicks area where I'm from. He was saved at the church that I attended for many, many years, Riverdale Baptist Church, when he was a little kid. And so I knew Slim. Well, Slim is a perfect example of someone who had, his family had absolutely no money. They rented property. They were share croppers, if you want to call it that, the Ozarks, who were growing cotton, but trying to get by. And he went from an absolute nobody to then ultimately in 1955, when the Jubilee goes on TV nationally, Slim Wilson is seen by how many people? How many people saw the Jubilee? Nine million. Nine million is cut. I, I've heard estimates as much as 15 million people, but uh, Wayne's absolutely correct. They did not make a lot of money. Actually, when you played on the Jubilee or the Grand Ole Opry, you got union scale. You didn't, you didn't come out with a big old wad of bills. It was all about the exposure. And a lot of them commented, Without television, I would have never been able to perform before nine million people in my entire career. I haven't yet. <laughs> you? We're glad you're all here, but you're not nine million people. So, uh, I mean, it blew them away. And then the way the economics of it was. So, a lot of those early performers did it for free uh, because they wanted the exposure. Now, there were no t-shirt sales. They'd have some songbooks and things like that, but even records was really up and down, especially the Depression. D during the Depression, rec sales of records tanked, but not of radios, because it was so vital to those people's lives by the 30s that they would just about, you know, they would sell the mattress before they would sell the radio. Um, and so radio was like totally ingrained in, in the culture, but the economic model was, you played on the Jubilee or wherever, and then you'd jump in your car and you would do performances, personal appearances around in that area for six nights a week. And then you'd come back and do the Jubilee again. So here's a quick story just to let you know. One time, the Jubilee was on New Year's Eve. And I think it probably started at 7 p.m. that 
that time. Some of the performers on the Jubilee, I found a newspaper report, they were going to play at a New Year's Eve dance in Ava from 9 to midnight. So they played on the Jubilee, they hopped in the car, drove to Ava, and played three more hours. Uh, my point is, that's where the money was, was in personal appearances, as long as the promoter didn't, you know, jump out on you, uh, uh, you know, take the money and run, which happened quite often, evidently. But that was the, that's how you could make a living making music was through appearances, and it was a grueling lifestyle. I was telling John, it's like, you think, oh, if I'm a big movie, you know, big country and western star, and life's easy. I, I play for an hour, and the rest, I just, you know, sit at the bar for the rest of the day. No, they were grueling travel, two-lane roads, usually at night, going around making these appearances. It was a grueling lifestyle, and most of them didn't live, a lot of them died in their 50s and 60s. They just did not live long life. I want to talk a little bit about the reaction to the program. We've tell, told you a lot about the history of it and who was on it. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit from, and if, you, if you'd like to know more, there is a great article about the program on Wikipedia. It's great because I wrote most of it. But, <laughs> but anyway, this, so I'm going to read a, just a little section from that article. During the program's premiere in 1955, Red Foley said, if you folks want us to come and visit at your house like this every Saturday night, why don't you drop me a line here in Springfield, Missouri? Well, in the next week, 25,000 cards and letters arrived from 45 of the 48 states at the time. Uh, and the show was on um, 72 ABC affiliates. The only TV show, and with Tom talked about this earlier today with me, the only TV show with an audience equally divided among men, women, and children. It was very unusual at the time. Uh, so for 1955, uh, it had also the largest male U.S. television audience, if you can believe that. It had 28% more per set viewers than the average of all primetime shows, and it had the largest we talked about this today, the largest per set U.S. television audience, more than, more than three people, uh, 3.4, not a four point of a person, but <laughs> that many people were gathered around the set to watch this because it was so family friendly and I guess so, so interesting. So, anyway. Yeah, it was a great show. And, and as John said, in the early, so let me back up and say, we knew that television as a technology was possible in the 20s. There were demonstrations of television. But to have uh, you know, millions of people buying television sets and to have what, 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 what I call the adoption and diffusion of a technology, where it gets out into the population, well, we had these little events, as, as Wayne's alluded to, called the Depression and the Second World War. So television had kind of this long latency period. We knew we could do it. But there was a kind of an economic model, and world events were such that it couldn't really take off, grab hold and take off. So it was really like a 20-year latency period. But after the war, and just a little, a little bit about the war, the other thing about the war is people who knew about country music were in, stationed all over the world. And, you, you know, it was a tough life, but you had some time off, you know, downtime. And, that was getting on other people from other parts of the country and other parts of the world at least exposed to what we now call country music. So I think that actually the war did a lot of bad things, but also there were some good things that came out of that. And was part of that was like getting people to sort of, oh, that's an interesting type of music. And so right after the war then, television's coming on and uh, you've got country music is, is gaining market share in terms of the entire music sphere. It was, it was growing like Topsy. Um, and so it's just like the right mix. But as I get farther into this research, yes, the technological conditions were such and the world conditions were such that it was just almost like the right mix of ingredients for this amazing show to, to take off. But ultimately it was about this amazing group of talented people behind the camera and in front of the camera that made it happen. And the easiest way to say, it's much easier to list who didn't appear on the Ozark Jubilee than who did. I mean, it's almost like Elvis didn't. Uh, uh, 
Uh, they, Willie they, Nelson did. Yeah, the, the, uh, Elvis, El, they considered Elvis, but the story that I understand is he was considered to be a flash in the pan. Yeah. <laughs> but really, it's almost like on one hand you can count the major country western stars uh, broadly defined of that era who did not appear on the Ozark right. Jubilee. But the thing we can't forget is that a lot of the talent was from Southwest Missouri. That's right. So you want to you expand on that? Uh, I'm a native of the Ozarks, and on that basis, when you do a show that is live, then you can only script it so much. In the Ozark Jubilee, every show, if you take the 50 weeks, 52 weeks, and start multiplying that out by six years, approximately, there are 300 and some shows. They were all live. You cannot hide your Ozarks accent <laughs> for 300 and some shows. You can't really hide your accent at all. The Ozarks was well represented by the Ozark Jubilee. Now, notice that the original name of the show was the Ozark Jubilee. That's 1953, 54, 55, 56. We get to 1957, and the show was doing well, but for whatever reason, pressure was put to do away with the Ozark part of it. So they started calling it the Country Music Jubilee, legally, professionally. Then they called it the Jubilee USA. Again, trying to get rid of the Ozarks. Well, you can't get rid of Slim Wilson. You can't get rid of Spitty Hallworth. You can't get rid of Shorty Sue and Sally and the boys. And you can't get rid of Zed Tennis. And if you're going to do an Ozark show, they always had to fall back on the local talent. Yeah. And, and I got to say, you can't get rid of Goo Goo Rutledge either. <laughs> so, Lady uh, Goo Goo. So two things we have to talk about, just to touch on, because I know we're running out of time. Uh, one is the great comedy that occurred on yeah. the Ozark Jubilee. And a lot of it was Ozarks, people from the Ozarks. So Goo Goo Rutledge grew up in Springfield. Um, and uh, Lenny Aylshare was from the, from the Ozarks region. Um, so a lot of the comedy was uh, local comedy. The other thing about comedy, so uh, it's a funny thing about human beings. If you like a song, you could listen to that song a lot. Um, uh, and, and so like uh, A Satisfied Mind, I think was played six times, performed six times in the first year of the Ozark, of, as a national broadcast. So that's okay. But as Pete Stamper, one of the comics uh, on the Jubilee once observed, once you tell a joke to nine million people, the next time you try to entertain them, you've got to have a different joke. <laughs> and so it became almost like a content beast. You know, you had to have people appearing all the time. And it was live television, and there was no eight-second delay. Everybody understands that. You know, there was no like, oh, we had a wardrobe malfunction, or somebody dropped the F-bomb, or whatever. Uh, it went out immediately to nine million people. They saw and heard what happened on that stage. So it was an amazing achievement, I think, of, of uh, both, and both behind the scenes too, because Don Richardson was one of the writers, right. and, and Cy Simon, and it was, it, to, in my mind, it was more about the people than the technology per se. And, and Wade is absolutely right about the, the Ozarks-centric part of the show, and the, the, the regular cast that appeared, and there were maybe 20 people that were sort of interchangeable in various roles, they were primarily from the Ozarks. But as the, as, you know, we're talking six years, so as the six years go by, it's attracting more and more big stars, right? These are the people, some of the people that were on the Jubilee, Roy Acuff, Rex Allen, Bill Anderson, Chet Atkins, uh, Gene Autry, uh, the Carter sisters, Johnny Cash, uh, we talked about Patsy Klein, Cowboy Copas, Jimmy Dean was on the Jubilee, uh, Little Jimmy Dickens, uh, George Hamilton IV, Homer and Jethro, uh, Ferlin Husky, of course, was on a lot, Stonewall Jackson, George Jones. I mean, I could go on and on and on. This, this was, it was huge uh, to bring that level of talent uh, across the country from little old Springfield, Missouri folks. If uh, Peter Hershey was here today, from Silver Dollar City, 
he would say, I know he would say, that the Ozark Jubilee was one of the success points for the original Marble Cave, Silver Dollar City era. Silver Dollar City opened in 1960. That's basically the year the Jubilee closed down. But what was going on between 1953, 54, 55, and 1960, that five or six year period, was every week, Joe Slattery, the announcer, if not Red Foley or whoever was running the show that night, whoever was the MC, they would say, come to the Ozarks, come and see us. We want you to be a part of this. We want you to come and be on, you know, in the audience to see what's going on here. And one other thing I want to mention about values, and that's one of the problems with the Jubilee. The Jubilee eventually closed down partly because Red Foley had a lot of problems. He was the star of the show. You can't really have a successful show without a star, not nationally, not like, not that kind of a show. <laughs> values. Ozark's values were found on the Ozark Jubilee at least in one way. And I wonder how many of you would know what that one way was, if you ever saw the show or if you ever heard of it, at the end of the show, what did they do? What was the last song almost always, every week, a song of inspiration, a gospel song, a song with meaning, peace in the valley, just a closer walk with thee, yeah. my friend, yeah. someone, who, someone who cares. And that was representative of the values of the Ozarks, and one of the reasons that the show lasted as long as it did, I think. And I'll give you a little anecdote about that, too, that, that you're quite right about ending with that inspirational song by Red. And Dad told me, and this is, you guys know what a great performer Red Foley was. Uh, Dad told me that uh, when Red would begin to sing that song, he would have to try to not listen or not look or he'd start crying. Uh, I think we need to wrap up. We might have some time for Q&A. I don't actually don't know when this session is supposed to end, but I think we're pretty close to it. Um, um, let me just say one last thing uh, before we open up for some Q&A. Um, about six years ago, uh, Wayne Glenn uh, set up an appointment with me, came into my office, and uh, I think I knew about the Ozark Jubilee, but I don't, didn't know a whole lot about the Jubilee. And he said, I found some Jubilee recordings at the UCLA Film and Television Archive out in LA. And we need to get those. I think that was a direct quote of Wayne's. <laughs> so I listened to him, and I started working with UCLA Film and Television uh, Archives. And uh, just yesterday, or the day before yesterday, I announced on my Facebook page that, and in other ways, that we finally secured enough funding to digitize their entire holdings of Old York Jubilee. It's 63 kinescopes, although one uh, was too far deteriorated. We already know one is too far gone to digitize. And so over 60, and then through other sources, including uh, the Brian Bisney collection that uh, John has allowed us to digitize, there are some other episodes. So we're probably gonna have upwards of 75 uh, episodes of the Jubilee when we're finished here, probably within the next year up online, free of charge. It's amazing entertainment. Uh, I was born in 57, so I do not remember seeing, having seen the Jubilee <laughs> as a child. But it's, to this day, it's amazing entertainment. Um, and with that, I will uh, open it up for Q&A. Uh, did Ken Burns include all this in his <laughs> we, were talking, we, we were talking about that. Yeah. Ken Burns, the history of country music. I watched the entire series because I bought, bought it so I could watch it, you know, and not miss anything. Basically nothing. What one mention, one mention in connection with Brenda Lee. Yeah, yeah. and that, that's a very good question. And, um, you know, as soon as I saw, you know, when they start off and they tell, you know, this program is made possible through the generous support of X, Y, and Z, it was all Nashville money. Pretty much as near as I could tell, and I said, oh, "This is not going to go well." First time I watched it, and it didn't go well. So there's always been kind of this for a while there. <coughs> excuse me. There was there was serious talk that Springfield, Missouri, might replace Nashville, Tennessee, as the mythic capital of country music. And there was about a year or two, I would say, where it was like, "Yeah, we're really, that might really happen." Uh, I think to this day, and no offense if anybody has connections with Nashville, I think there's still a little bit of animosity right. 
between the two regions. Right. And so, um, anyway. Because they did Texas and then they did California. Yeah, I know. And it was nationwide. That's the other thing, you know, you got to realize there was a country music television, early on, television program that originated from Greenwich Village in Manhattan. Oh, Village Barn. So it was nationwide. Yeah. And then I hope you all know that one of the biggest early country and western uh, hillbilly variety shows, I call them, came out of Chicago. It was the National Barn Dance and uh, Pop Quiz. So in my mind, and you can rebut if you want, but of all those shows, you know, it was the Louisiana Hayride and Big D Jamboree in Dallas and Wheeling, West Virginia and Cincinnati, all over there were you know, these kind of shows. The three biggest ones today are National Barn Dance out of Chicago, Grand Old Opry, I'll give him that, out of Nashville, and the Ozark Jubilee out of Springfield. He's really on the right track. Okay, yeah. Yeah. here's the question. For the free trip, all expense <laughs> paid, no. um, which it? performer had a significant role in each of those three major productions? Red Foley, right? That's right. Nobody else. That's right. So he kind of spans the whole thing from, he, he came to Chicago in the late 20s, early 30s, I think. Early 30s. Early 30s. Then he went to, he was like the, the head of the uh, Grand Old Opry when it was the uh, Prince Albert hour, half hour on the Grand Old Opry, the National Park, yeah. And then Cy, allegedly over a bottle of Jack Daniels, uh, lured Red to come to Springfield. It was a huge risk. Huge, for, huge deal. Huge the, risk. He, he was him. the biggest star yeah. in, in Nashville and the biggest star on the Grand Ole Opry at the time. Do we have time for one more? I want the address of the Jewel Theater. Uh, it's, there's a marker there. Um, South Jefferson. You know, the corner of Jefferson, and I still call it East, Lake, East St. Louis. I think they call it Park Central East or something like that now. But it's, it'll always be. You know where the Woodruff Building is? Okay, I work Southwestern. Southwestern. Uh, yeah, you knew where it was, didn't you? Southwestern Bell, across the street. Yes. The old Bell. Okay, yeah. I thought it was. It was That's it. Restaurant. McDaniel and Jefferson. Yeah. 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 For years, I've been told that the Everly Brothers got their start on the Jubilee. Is there any truth to that? I don't think so. I've never known. They, they were too young to. I mean, we had kid performers, but I think they. No, I don't. I don't, I don't know if they were ever on the show. I don't think so. Was Dolly Parton on the Jubilee? No. No. Too no. young. She was too young, and Hank Williams had already died. Yeah. He was already dead. Hank died, uh, well, January 1st of 1950. If we have any questions, they either need to be repeated or online. Sorry. Because oh, okay. of the live Sorry. stream. Because okay. then, then people are just getting the answer. They don't know what it means. That's good. Uh, so right. the question before was, was Dolly Parton ever on? And no, she was and, not. And the Everly Brothers. And we were asked about that. And the Everly Brothers. And who okay, over here. I'll repeat the question. Oh. I remember, too. The question I have is, Brenda Lee, the only one that was given a uh, name that was not Oh, like stage names? Yeah. Oh, most of them had stage names. Uh, we were talking about Susie Arden. Right. Her actual name was Susie Darden. And she dropped the D. I, I mean, just a lot of times it's like, you got to have a better name than what you got. And it, often the, the stories I've heard is like, it's just like, you know, over dinner or something. They just and, make and, a quick and, decision. And the Jubilee <laughs> didn't really give anybody any stage names, like to have. Or that name to be on the show, although Red did call uh, Norma Jean, he started calling her Pretty Miss Norma Jean, <laughs> and that sort of stuck. Yeah. Uh, one, one quick story, though, is that, oh, well, uh, Chet Atkins was actually with KWTO twice. He got fired one, the first time he was here. Uh, and then, but I think this is true that he was known as, his, his real name was Chester, and the first person to call him Chet was Cy Simon. Yeah, that's right. So, some of them. Where, where online did you say the Ozark Jubilee episode would be available? Uh, so we have about, I don't know, 35 up there right now. Um, Repeat the question. Oh, where, where, so of these recordings that we've digitized and they're now online free of charge, where are they? Um, gosh, I should, I should have that 
uh, etched in my brain. But if you just go to Google or what, your favorite search engine and just do Ozark Jubilee, Missouri State, you'll find the link. And they're all listed there. And my great staff have done, um, they'll, they'll do like, they're usually half hour segments. That's how they did it. That's how they you know, did them. And they actually did the show that way so that every half hour was almost like a, a self-contained thing. And absolutely free, courtesy. Yeah, MSU. absolutely free. Uh, it's in our agreement with UCLA that we have non-exclusive rights to do whatever we want with them. And we say, well, we're a public university, so we're going to make them free to have everybody who got an internet connection. Just, just, just go to YouTube. They're all on YouTube. They're all on YouTube. 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 We actually have a Search dedicated channel in YouTube. That's so once YouTube you find YouTube. them, it's like they're all right there. Right. And then what they've done is like, if you say, okay, Google Rutledge is becoming routine beginning at the 11 minute 35 second mark, and you can click right on there, because I'm a big Goo Goo fan. <laughs> if I need my daily dose of Goo Goo, I can get it really easily <laughs> by going to this location. You gotta see what Goo Goo looks like for him to be yeah. a big fan. There was a pop singer out of Nashville named Phyllis Spain, who went on and became a singer with the Opry called Tabby West. Tabby West yeah. Does anybody know where she is today or if she's still around? This is the guy. That's a loaded question. Uh, uh -huh. the, did you know, I did a post on that, actually three posts on that, on my Facebook here about, what, five weeks ago? She's 93 years old and apparently is still living in Nashville. When the Jubilee went off in 1960, basically, that seems to have been the end of her career. It shouldn't have been, necessarily. She made photograph records for DECA, for Capitol. She was nice looking. She was heavily promoted on the Jubilee show. She worked a lot of shows all over the United States with other groups. And for whatever reason, like I said, in 1960, she falls off the map. And I it took me a lot of work to research, just like I said, about six weeks ago, and finally find her, still living, mm. in Nashville mm. at the age of 93. Mm. I, I don't know what her status is, but I do know that, how did you remember that name? How did you know her name? I, I met her when she was on the show. She came to Hannibal with, uh, with her and uh, Bill Wimberly and uh, yeah. uh, Marvin Rainwater. Now, Tabby West is the name she went by, but you knew her real name. Yeah, yeah that's cool. Uh, was it Tabby West that, uh, I, in doing research, um, she went all the way up to Alaska one summer to tour. And about the, I think about July and August are the only time you can go up to Alaska to tour, and it's almost always daylight. She was doing four shows a night in Alaska for a couple of weeks. So when you talk about a grueling appearance schedule, four shows a night. Uh, other questions? I'll leave you with one story then. I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, my story is, so I've been working on a book, it's not out yet, unfortunately, uh, but I'm about finished with a book about the Ozark Jubilee, and uh, I've been trying to learn as much as I can. So, Brenda Lee. So, I call up her publicist, just out of the blue, and I think I'm going to have some flunky pick up the phone, if anybody picks up the phone. Second ring, somebody picks it up, I'm, I'm, I want to talk to her, I forget what her name is, it's her. So I explain who I am and why. I just want to, is there any possibility I could interview Brenda Lee? Well, let me put you in touch with your manager. What's your email address? I'll let you know. I thought, oh boy, I'm going to scratch that off. I'm never going to hear from them again. The manager emails me, I think, before the end of the day. What, what, what do you want to do? I, I'm working on this book. I want to talk to her. Let me get back to you. Okay, scratch it off again, you know? She gets back to me and said, sure, come on over. So I said, well, here, you know, here's like three dates I could come over. Okay, let's do this one. Gives me the home address of Brenda Lee. I, I show up, and Brenda opens the door. Hey, how are you? <laughs> Doesn't know me from Adam. Brings me into her, uh, kind of her study, and, you know, gold records on the wall. Nicest person imaginable. Hey, Ronnie, my husband's in the kitchen, you know, we'll talk to him later. Uh, her married name is Shacklett, so um, uh, Ronnie's in the kitchen. We talked for over an hour, just, you know, I just recorded, uh, and, and nicest person imaginable. Uh, and, you know, it's not a palatial estate, it's a nice home, but it's not, you know, palatial. Uh, and so 
it's amazing sometimes if you just like dial that number and somebody's going to pick up and hey, what do you need, you know? And uh, so anyway, it's just been amazing. Uh, the pe it really to kind of bring it back. It's really about this amazing group of people that made this amazing show happen uh, in the immediate post-war era that it's, we're trying to save that because I think there's so much we can learn about values and entertainment and early television and country and western music and the Ozarks by studying this program. So thanks very much. <laughs>